Are you a warrior? Maybe you're easily stressed. Are you quickly negative? What about kind of pessimistic? Are you somewhat of a doomsdayer? Well, guess what? You don't have to be. Fear doesn't have to win all the time. Face it with us. Let's learn how to deal with it all. Living fearless. If you have your Bibles, look at Matthew 8. Matthew chapter 8, we're going to be doing an old familiar story. We're going to talk about Jesus calming a storm. Anybody in here feel like they're in a storm? Y'all are going to have to talk back more than that. When you're there, say amen. Amen, amen. amen. It's a story that we've all heard since we were little kids. And truth be known, I remember, I remember doing those little coloring pages, you know, we used to do in Sunday school. Miss Eva's sitting over there, yeah, she's, she's not. I remember doing these little color pages even in preschool Sunday school. And then I noticed, I remember posters taped along the walls. You remember those back in the old church? We had all the stories, the great stories of the Bible who just all of a sudden this story and that story well depicted on there. I, I remember, <coughs> I remember uh, I had a high school teacher, her name was Miss Mathis, and, and, and you could almost read the Bible just by the posters in the wall. You know what I'm talking about? It would just go through there and you would see this. It's really one of the big stories. It's one that sort of everybody knows and everybody understands. And most every preacher, sooner or later, gets around to putting their own twist to it, if you would. It's been the subplots, if you will, for movies. And even a single verse from this story will probably come flooding up to your mind the rest of the passages and cause you to remember the whole story. It's really not a very secret what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the story of Jesus calming the seas. And while Matthew and Mark really, they, they only devote like five or six verses apiece to this, there's a great lesson to be told and a great lesson we can pull from this story, and it goes something like this. It had already been a long day for the disciples and for Jesus. Jesus had, he had healed many that day, including Peter's mother-in-law, and they kept coming. Have you, ever, have you ever just had people that once you do something for them, they just keep on coming at you? You, you give them a little bit and they take a mile. You give, them, you give them an inch and they take a yard. It doesn't matter. They want more and more of whatever you got. That People were pulling on Jesus and the disciples from the left and from the right. And scriptures even record that, that when Jesus saw the crowd continuing to grow that, that, and, and written, it's written in the John Redneck version, but Jesus basically nudges the disciples and he said, let's go. <laughs> let's get out of here. It's not that Jesus didn't want to heal any more people. It's not that he didn't want to touch any more lives. But how many people know that ministry will wear you out? And whether you know it or not, if you've ever worked in ministry a day in your life, you know that ministry will take your life. It will kill you, it will chew you up, and it will spit you out. And while you're laying on the ground as a big puddle of spit, there will be somebody that will come up and try to figure out some way they can take something else from you. And I don't know if you know this, but as tight as this family is, I can promise you that every pastor in this church has felt that way. That's truth. Ministry is tough. And Jesus saw it was tough, and Jesus said, let's go. Let's get to the other side. Let's, let's pick up the story 
where Matthew picks it up in these few verses. Matthew 8, beginning with verse 23. It says this, Then Jesus got into the boat, and he started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly, turn to your neighbor and say, suddenly. Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with the waves breaking into the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Look at your other neighbor and say, sleeping. The disciples went over and they woke him shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? Why do you have so little faith? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed, amazed. Tell yourself, I am amazed. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man is what they thought. They even asked, even the winds and the waves obey him? Hey, we live here on the Gulf Coast, and we know full well what storms are. We know what it's like for a big storm to be in the Gulf, and all of a sudden, every warning sign we've got goes off, and we measure them. We look at them. And we know that storms can be rough and tough. And what you need to know about this passage is this storm wasn't just the average Joe storm. This storm was big. In fact, it was bigger than big. It was giant. It was huge. And Matthew, when he's pinning this, you can't see it in the English, but if we could peel back the English words and read some of the Greek, we would, we would see Matthew searching and searching, how do I describe this big storm? How do I, I describe this word? How do I say how really big this storm was? And he looks down his pages and he finally finds a word, and the word is seismos. We, we today still have, have some, some, some vocabulary that falls out of those words, like seismologist. Seismologist measures earthquake or seismograph. It measures the earthquake and how big it shakes the land. This is a huge storm. It shook the very boat and the sea that was sitting on top of it. It it shook the shoreline for all it's worth. Now, if you listen to the word by itself, seismos, maybe it just sounds like another word. But how many people know that different words mean different things to different people? You go in the Midwest and you say the word Katrina, And they'll look at you and say, who's that? But you say it down here, and it makes us shake. When Matthew penned this word, seismos, he's trying to very carefully this word for you to talk about the size. This size wasn't small. It wasn't medium. It wasn't just big. It was massive. In fact, Matthew only uses this word two other times in his Gospels. Two other times does Matthew actually write down the word seismos. The first time after this that he writes the word, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he dies, and the earth shook. And Matthew records that this was a great seismos. The next time, the very final time that Matthew writes this word in his gospel is when Jesus rises from the grave and it shakes the ground so hard that the Bible records that it woke the dead, the great seismos. So when I'm talking about the storm, when I'm describing the storm, hear me that this wasn't your ordinary storm. This is something Matthew equates with the death of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus. This was a big event. It is held in the trilogy of words. This storm is huge. It's a seismos. We have those storms in real life too, right? 
you're sitting in a doctor's office and the doctor knocks on the door and comes in and sits down and he has a solemn look on his face and in the next 10 minutes unfolds your new diagnosis of cancer. It's a seismos. The storm is massive and it just shook you to the core. You get a call, it's two o'clock in the morning. You don't recognize the number and you pick it up and all you hear is a recording naming some random jail or something and it's a collect call and you all of a sudden hear your kid's name announced and you find out your son or daughter is in jail. You're shaken to the core. It's a seismos. It's a storm that you're going through. It's this storm is the size of a home being closed in foreclosure or maybe even the size of a death of a spouse. It's earth shattering. It's foundation cracking. It's a storm that causes fear to rise up from the deepest part of the darkest place of your soul. That's a seismos. That's what Matthew is describing. And if it's not scary enough that he uses such a strong word, if it, that's not enough, he looks across and he describes that it came about as suddenly. It wasn't something you planned for. It wasn't something you calendared for next week. It wasn't something that you thought about and you had everything in order. It's something that blindsided you all of a sudden. Your plans did not include this and all of a sudden your life has been turned upside down. You've been horse collared by debt and you have been strangled by circumstance and you never saw what happened. There's a bad feeling when storms come suddenly. It makes you shake and it makes you shudder. Maybe you're like Peter and John and during the storm you're working hard to bail the boat and to pull down the sails or maybe you're something a, more, a little more like, I'm going to guess Matthew was, and you're just happy if you can hold down your lunch. It's a seismos. Only hours ago, they were walking through the town. They would have been happy to have people pulling on them now. That seemed easy, but it seemed like something they had to get away from. Sure, there was some pushing and shoving. People were grabbing a few loaves of bread, but there was nothing there that they couldn't handle at that time. And whose bright idea was this anyway to get on the boat? Jesus? Hey, let's go get on a ship and ride through a storm. Mark records an extra line or two to this story. He's telling the story, and, and then he pins this. He writes this. He says, Jesus was in the boat sleeping. He's taking an afternoon siesta. He's napping. I, I, I read, I, I, I'm studying, I'm pouring in this. One author records it like this. The seas are roaring, and Jesus is snoring. There's a seismos going on. Jesus, you're asleep? You're asleep? How, how can you sleep in the middle of this? The disciples, I'm guessing probably a little waterlogged and drenched, hurt, if you would, shake Jesus awake, and they ask him one question that I believe we all ask when our life finds a seismos. The disciples shake him and say, don't you even care? God, don't you care that my life has been turned upside down? Aren't you even the least bit concerned, God? We're fighting for our life out here. I'm God trying to hold my family together. Don't you care? 
My finances are in a shamble, God. You're not bringing me any relief whatsoever. God, don't you care? I'm being shaken to the core and don't know if I'm going to live. And we shake our fist to God and we look at him and say, don't you care? Don't you care? I think it's very telling that not one disciple, at least as it's recorded, called Jesus out there to help. I think it's, I think it's really telling that not one disciple looked at Jesus and said, do you have any experience, anything at all that can help us get through this storm? Is there anything, Jesus, that you can do? Instead of talking to him about things he could do, instead of asking him for help, they instead questioned the very character of God. They had just walked miles with him healing the sick and caring for the poor. They had seen miracle after miracle after miracle in their life. They had witnessed lepers that were cleansed, and they saw demons scatter. And yet their question is not, can you do a miracle in my life? But don't you care? Do you even care? That's the one question. It's like they had some form of spiritual amnesia, some type of miracle memory lapse, if you would. Something in their brain didn't click for the earlier part of the day. They had already forgotten all the good He had done all day long. You know, fear will do that. Fear will make you forget every accomplishment you had in front of it. Fear will make you shudder and forget every mountaintop you've already climbed. And the only thing you will see is the valley you're sitting in. Fear will lock your sights in. Fear will make you forget every bit of good in your life and every good person. Fear will make you fixate on safety rather than floating with the Savior. The disciples cry, don't you even care? And Jesus' quick wit response is, why are you even afraid? Now, now, don't get me wrong. This series, as we unfold about fear, I believe that there is healthy fear in life. I'm not telling you that there are not things we need to be afraid of. Listen, when I was a kid, I learned very quickly that irons are hot. And when I would see a light on an iron, I would run. I learned to fear that iron. I learned to fear about crossing a busy road. I started doing it and somebody locked up the brakes and about hit me and daddy about tore off the backside of me instead of the backside of the car. How many people know that parents need to stop blaming the people that were on the street and start blaming the kids and spanking the kids for running out in the road? Sometimes a little healthy investment of fear will help you. I'm not saying that fear is bad. You wake up in the middle of the night and you smell something. It smells like something burning. That fear that goes into you right there and gets you out of a burning house, that's a good thing. But let me make something real clear that I'm not talking about. If fear is causing you to become over-anxious. 
If fear is, is causing you to go on drinking binges, if fear is causing you to grab a hold of things tighter and act like you have some control over this world, then that's not good. Amen. Fear. Fear itself isn't good or bad. It's what you do afterwards that matters. Listen, I'm going to give you a quote. I, I, I don't know where I found it, but I like this quote. Listen, listen to this. Just because fear knocks on your door doesn't mean you have to invite it in for dinner. Listen to that again. Just because fear knocks on your door does not mean that you have to invite it in for dinner. Some storms in your life are going to shake you to your very core. They're going to hurt you. They're going to make you afraid. You're not going to know where to turn and what to do. But if you let the fear control you, you'll never walk out of there alive. When I was um, about four years old, we had an old wall furnace, and, and I'm going to show my, 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 my date myself. Kids already know this story in here, but it was one of those tall wall furnaces. It started about here in the wall and went all the way up to the ceiling, and, and, and it was metal, and it poked out, and it had, had a little place you could look almost like a viewfinder in it, and you could see the flames in there. Anybody old enough to remember those old things? And then when they would cut on, man, the flames would whoom right all the way through there, and you'd hear it all the way across the house. I believe that it was the great green monster in my house. I'm convinced that's what it was. From my room, I would stay up and I would watch the lights from that flame reflecting on the walls inside the hall. The temperature would fall in my house and the furnace would decide to fire up. From my bed... It looked like the biggest monster I had ever seen in my entire life. It breathed fire, and it made this horrible noise every time it woke up. And I just knew that it lived off of a diet of four-year-olds. I became obsessed at making sure that my toes never leaked out from under the bed sheets. <laughs> and then certainly I would never let my fingers hang over the sides of the bed. Whew. If they ever started that way, the roar from that great green monster would cause me to very quickly jerk them back in as safety as fast as I could. Lord forbid those times that I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd have to go to the bathroom <laughs> or needed a glass of water. I would sit in my bed <laughs> trying my best to hold it for what seemed like hours negotiating with my fears, trying to work with my fears. And slowly, I would sneak out of bed and make it to my room's door. And I would stand there waiting to the great green machine. Finally went to sleep. And I'd pounce I would jump from my threshold straight over to my mom and dad's because if I knew, if I ever stepped on the carpet in the hall, that was just his tongue and it would pull me in. I would go over to see my dad and I'd nudge him. Dad, y'all know what this is like. He would start waking up a little bit. John, what you need? I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, John, go to the bathroom. I can't go to the bathroom. It'll lead me. 
Oh, that's silly, John. I, I, Dad, Dad, I promise. I saw it tonight. And he'd look at me and he'd say, why are you afraid? And I'd sit there and I'd still be trembling. And I believe my dad had superhuman strength. I believe my dad had super courage because he would get up out of bed in his night clothes and he'd start walking towards that hall. I would tuck in behind him and I would grab a hold of that T-shirt like there was no tomorrow. And do you know that he would walk in that hall and right by that great green monster and not even flinch? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? That's all he wanted to know. Why are you afraid? Is it possible? Is it just possible that the seismos that you have in your life is nothing more than a great green monster to Jesus? It looks big to you. It's earth shattering from your perspective. It's cutting you to the very core. And Jesus is sleeping in the corner. We're screaming at the top of our lungs, Jesus, why don't you care about me? Jesus, why do you let this stuff happen to me? Jesus, why? Oh, why? I'm tired of going around this track. Jesus is asleep. Because Jesus is not afraid of the great green monster. What seems like a seismos to us is nothing but a figment of his imagination. And in a very minute, he can speak a word and all of your troubled seas get calmed in an instant. Amen? Amen. 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 Here's the question. What are you worried about? Honestly, what are you worried about? You can pretend that you're really not worried about something. I got a secret. I'm your pastor. You tell on yourselves. You sit in my office and and you cry about this and you cry about that. I'm not making fun of you. That is exactly what we're here to do as a family. But some of us are letting fear dictate our circumstance. Some of us are having an inappropriate response to fear. Some of us, uh, the, the fear itself has got us wrapped up so tight that we couldn't try to face the great green monster if we tried. We're too wrapped up in the bed sheets. What are you fighting with? What are you struggling with? If I ask you the question, are you really ready to give it up? Could you answer that tonight and say, yeah, I'm ready? Could you really answer that and say, I'm through? Over the next several weeks, we are going to talk about fear. We're going to face our fears. Some of our big fears We're going to unlock some things in you that I believe are going to set you free for the rest of your life. But let me tell you something. That means you got to get honest with yourself. You're going to have to start admitting to yourself what you're afraid of. But I believe if you do that, it'll inject you with some energy in this new year that makes you where you can walk out on top of the clouds 
and people will be looking at you, and you know what? You may not be a... Again, we are incredibly glad that you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. I encourage you to go to the website. There you can find any of our archive podcasts. You can send us an email about how God's working in your life or a prayer request, or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.